Hello everyone and welcome back. When you write a paper and you submit it to a journal or a conference, there are a few sections that can highly determine the likelihood that your paper is going to be accepted or rejected. We have already made videos in this channel on how to write an abstract, an introduction and a related work section. And these are some of the videos that have received the highest views that I've made, so make sure to check them out and I'm going to link them in the description below. Today we're going to talk about another very important section, which is the experimental evaluation. And what are the expectations that the reviewers are going to have for this section? And how can we make sure that we organize this section properly and we deliver what is expected in order to maximize the chances that our paper is going to be accepted? Before we start, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel so that the content can reach a wider audience and also help more students and colleagues. Thank you very much and let's start. The experimental evaluation section is the section of the paper where you provide a quantitative comparison of your solution with respect to the state of the art. So in our papers, generally we propose nice algorithmic solution that maybe have some nice theoretical properties, but then the question is how these solutions actually perform in practice and how they perform with respect to previous solutions that have been proposed for the same problem. And so this is exactly what the experimental evaluation section is. So in some sense, it closes the loop. After you have described in the related work what is the limitation of the literature, after you have proposed your solution and maybe you have proved some of the formal properties of your solution, you can actually show experimentally what is the advantage of the solution that you are proposing. One of the first thing I want to address is what is a good organization for the experimental section. So I like it to divide it in three major subsections. The first one in which you explain the comparison approaches, the second one in which you explain the experimental setup, and the third one in which you present the results and also you provide the discussion. And now we are going to talk about each of these individually in detail. So the first subsection is the subsection that explain the comparison approaches. As we already said, the purpose of the experimental evaluation section is to provide a quantitative evaluation with other state-of-the-art approaches. So what you really need to make sure when you write this subsection is that you, of course, provide the references to the work that you use for comparison. Also, you need to explain why you picked these specific works because they are supposed to be the best in that domain. So what is the reason why you pick these specific ones? And then also provide some ideas of how they work. Of course, space is limited, but you need to provide enough insights so that the reader can understand why the performance look that way in the subsequent results that you're going to describe. Also, sometimes for these approaches, we need to adapt them to our specific scenario because they have not been designed with that exact scenario in mind. So if you did any adaptation, this is also the section in which you should describe these adaptations. So what you should not do is just to provide the reference and expect the reader to figure it out and understand how those things work and expect the reader to go and find in these other papers the details of those approaches. So in this subsection, you should provide enough information for the reader to understand how those approaches work, why you pick them, and why we are going to see certain performances in the future. Another fundamental subsection of the experimental results section is the experimental setup. So here you should explain how you perform the experiments. At the highest level of abstraction, we find the numerical results. So basically here you implement it generally in a computer program, your solution, and you just run some numerical experiments to see how things go. At the next step, we have simulations. So simulations tend to be more realistic because they include more aspects of the environment that you are testing. And you can make this even more realistic by integrating them with real data sets of data that you can find, for example, online or that you collected yourself. And then at the highest level of realism, you find actual testbed. So implementing your solution on real devices and see how they perform. And sometime in a paper, you may combine, for example, simulation with some smaller testbed experiments in order to provide a more comprehensive evaluation.
This is also a good time to provide the parameter settings that you used in the experiment. So very often solutions are parameterized by certain values that determine the actual way in which they work. So here we want to know what are these values for the parameters that you have set in the experiments. It is also a good idea if these parameters are extremely important to provide what is called a sensitivity analysis. So see what is the impact of the most important parameters on the performance. And in the experiment, that I'm going to show you as an example in a few slides, you're going to see an exact example of this. Also, in the experimental setup, you may want to mention the metrics of success. So what are the experimental performance metrics that you're going to consider in the evaluation section? It is now finally the time to talk about the actual results. What I like to do is to organize the results in experimental scenarios. Each in the experimental scenarios analyze a different dimension of the problem. And so that these dimensions together are comprehensively covering what can happen in practice in many different settings. Also, you should make sure that these dimensions are orthogonal. So they, when you study one specific dimension, you keep the other constants so you can actually see what is the impact of that dimension with respect to the rest of the problem. It is very important to plan this well ahead and usually I always sit down with my students once the implementation is more or less complete and ask what are the experimental scenarios that you're going to study in this paper. And additionally, for each experimental scenario, what are the graphs that you're going to produce? What is going to be on the x-axis and what is going to be on the y-axis? What are going to be the metrics of success? And in this graph, it is very important that also you try to provide as much information as possible. So I often say that this graph should be dense of information. So the reviewer should actually spend time understanding what is the trend that you are seeing. And instead of having many, many different graphs that say information that is somehow redundant, it's much better to aggregate it in one single graph that is more informative. Additionally, it's also very important to perform multiple runs when we are going to uh, show the results. So every time we draw a point in a graph, and we are going to have an example in the next slide, you should make that point statistically meaningful. So they should represent some sort of average and confidence interval of the actual possibilities that may happen in that specific setting that you are considering with that point. So it is important to average over several runs in order to make that point more statistically reliable. I want to provide you now an example to go over some common mistakes that are made when an experimental result section is written. So here we can see a graph for one of our previous papers and you can find the citation down below, in which we are increasing, in this case, the number of nodes where you can place cameras in this approach, and you are studying the cost of doing that under different comparisons. So here you can see we have one performance comparison approach, which is called WVC, it is the black line, and we have our approach, which is called NT, and our approach at that time was parameterized by a certain parameter theta. And so this is exactly what I was referring before. Since the performance of theta actually changes a lot the performance of the algorithm, we have studied different settings of theta that cover a wider range from 1 to 1.5 and show what is the performance by increasing the number of nodes where you can uh, place cameras versus the cost. So here, one common mistake that I see very often people do is to just state the obvious. So, for example, here you would say that WVC does worse because it incurs a higher cost. And then as we increase delta, we can see a decrease cost for our approach. But that is obvious. I mean, anybody could see that. So what you should really say is why this happens. So first, in this example, you should say why WVC works worse than your algorithm. Why does it incur a higher cost? So that is why it's very important to provide the detail of the comparison approach at the beginning of the results section so that now people can understand why you can actually see the performance of that algorithm going that way compared to yours. Then you should explain why your algorithm performs better and why the performance of theta in this case in reduces the cost even further. Another mistake that I see pretty often is to not explain some non-trivial behavior that is shown in the graph. So, for example, one of these algorithms could show a peak. And a peak is something that you would not expect. So, if intuitively, you would expect the cost to increase with the percentage of nodes where you can place cameras here, then why we have a peak at a certain point with respect to 
another one. Is this something that is just an outlier or maybe there is some deeper meaning for which this is happening? So it's very important when something like this happens that you look at the results of your simulation, you try to understand why that happens, and then you explain it in the experimental results. Sometimes the answer is simple. You found an outlier and you just need to have more runs for that specific setting in order to get a more reliable point. But some other times the meaning can be deeper and can actually show a weakness of your algorithm that you just didn't think about. So that could be a good input for improving your algorithm and then run the experiments again and then see better performance. So this concludes this video. Thank you very much for watching. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel and also share this content if you find it useful. Thank you very much and goodbye.